Or ripples and fast ripples can occur superimposed on epileptiform spikes. However, sharply contoured waveforms, including epileptiform spikes, without fast ripples or ripples, when bandpass filtered, can result in ripples and fast ripples that are artifactual. And these events can be identified and discarded using special methods that can also quantify the spectral content, power, and duration of ripples, of fast ripples and ripples. Most of the work I will present to you today are from stereo EEG recordings from patients. I will also discuss with you recordings made by the Bank of Freed electrode. The Bank of Freed electrode records synchronous local field potentials for microelectrodes and intracranial EEG for macroelectrodes. The intracranial EEG records neural activity from up to a centimeter away, but cannot record action potentials from single cells. The local field potential recorded by the microelectrodes records neural activity from several hundred micrometers away and can record action potentials from single and multiple cells, which are called single units and multi-units. Fast ripples are an important neurophysiologic biomarker of epileptogenesis. In a study of eight sham control rats and 40 rats that were subject to traumatic brain injury and subsequently implanted with bilateral microelectrodes, 22 of the rats developed epilepsy after the injury and they were named the E plus group, while 18 rats did not develop epilepsy after the injury and they were named the E minus group. A comparison of fast ripple and ripple rates between the E plus and E minus group revealed that only in the E plus group were fast ripple rates significantly increased after the injury, whereas the ripple rates were not. Thus, fast ripples are an important uh, biomarker of epileptogenesis. Fast ripples are also intrinsic to seizure genesis. Shown in panel A is a seizure that begins here and is preceded by hypersynchronous epileptiform discharges. Panel B shows that superimposed on these hypersynchronous discharges are fast ripples that incrementally grow in power up until the time of seizure onset. These recordings are from rats treated with the chemoconvulsant canic acid. Panel C through E are recordings from patients who are implanted with a bank of freed micro macro electrode and had spontaneous seizures. Shown in panel E, is that prior to seizure onset, there were hypersynchronous spikes with superimposed fast ripples that incrementally grew in power, similar to the canic acid treated rat. Also in panel C is a seizure with a different onset morphology, a morphology called low voltage fast onset, and a hypersynchronous seizure with fast ripples was observed prior to the onset of this seizure. And in this case, it was a micro seizure that was only observed on the microelectrodes. Recently, surgical tissue from patients with gliomas and epilepsy showed that their seizures were also preceded by hypersynchronous discharges with superimposed fast ripples. Together, this re these results suggest that pathological neurons that generate the fast ripples may synchronize and coalesce, triggering seizure onset. In addition to triggering seizures, we recently found that fast ripples may prime or trigger the onset of epileptiform discharges. When fast ripples occurred within 300 milliseconds preceding an epileptiform spike, an interictal epileptiform spike, we found that the associated neuronal firing was much more vigorous than when a fast ripple occurred alone. This result suggests that the fast ripple primes the epileptiform spike to occur next. In further support of this notion, we found that the probability of a fast ripple preceding a spike within 300 milliseconds in the seizure onset zone was significantly greater than chance, but this was not the case in the non-seizure onset zone. And then in a separate cohort of patients who underwent epilepsy surgery, we found that the proportion of fast ripples preceding spikes in the seizure onset zone 
was much less than the proportion of fast ripples that occurred alone. Furthermore, when we looked at the proportion of fast ripples preceding spikes that had been resected, we found to our surprise that the proportion was actually higher in the patients that were not seizure-free after surgery. This suggests that other, re other regions outside of the spike initiation zone must need to be resected for seizure freedom to be achieved. Then we examined all the fast ripple generating tissue left over after the resection and found that in the patients who were not seizure free, more fast ripple generating territory remained after the resection. These results suggest that epileptogenic tissue outside the spike initiation zone can initiate seizures and epileptogenic tissue is necessary, but not sufficient for spike generation. Why is it important to understand the mechanism that generates epileptiform spikes? Firstly, epileptiform spikes are central to the diagnosis of epilepsy. <clears throat> Second, epileptiform spikes interfere with cognition in a neuroanatomically specific manner. And finally, identifying the location of the spike initiation zone may be useful for planning a more effective epilepsy surgery. So in conclusion of this section, fast ripples are biomarkers of epileptogenesis and injured brain tissue, and fast ripples are generated soon after the injury, but predict the occurrence of seizures later. In regions that generate seizures, fast ripples appear just prior to the seizure and may trigger the onset of the seizure, and fast, fast ripples prime epileptiform spikes to occur next in a spike initiation zone. And finally, epileptogenic tissue is necessary but not sufficient for spike initiation. The next part of my talk discusses identifying the mechanisms in physiological and pathological ripple generation. So ripples during slow wave sleep are more often studied in the context of understanding memory consolidation than understanding epilepsy. And this is because in most regions of the hippocampus, sharp wave ripples occur. And during the sharp wave ripples, neuronal ensembles replay experiences from wakefulness compressed forward and reverse. And when these sharp wave ripples occur, ripples also occur in association neocortex synchronized with the hippocampal ripples and this is thought to mediate information transfer and memory consolidation. And furthermore, when these ripples occur, they also occur superimposed on sleep spindles and slow waves. Sharp wave ripples in the hippocampus and healthy physiologic ripples in the cortex often occur during the down to up transition of the slow wave. And I'll explain in a moment what that means. And for reasons that are under investigation, ripples in epileptogenic regions occur more often at the up to down transition of slow wave excitability. However, differentiating the physiologic from pathologic ripples on the basis of slow wave excitability phase is difficult because there is much overlap. To study the differences between the physiological and pathological ripples, we examined data recorded from six patients at UCLA that was obtained by Dr. Yuval Nir of Tel Aviv University. These six patients underwent sleep studies shown in panels A through C, and they were implanted with a banky freed micro macro electrode shown in panels D and E. Panel F shows a segment of slow wave sleep. Note that the scalp EEG is a mirror image of the depth EEG. During the upward portion of the scalp EEG and downward portion of the depth EEG, the unit activity, the neuronal spiking is maximal. This is called the up state. And it's followed by the down state when the neuronal firing is silent. Slow wave sleep can be thought of as a constant transition between the up state to the down state and the down state to the up state. We use Duval's data to ask whether ripples and ripple associated action potentials occurred at distinct phases of slow wave excitability in the clinically defined seizure onset zone and non-seizure onset zone. In panel A, we show the ripple and ripple associated action potential probability at the different phases of slow wave excitability. 
we found that in the seizure onset zone, the ripple in ripple associated action probability was highest at the late up to down transition. Whereas in the non-seizure onset zone, the ripple and ripple associated action potential probability was highest at the down, down to up transition. Prior work had shown this to be the case, and we were more interested in the mechanism. To study the mechanism, we compared the firing of neurons within single neurons and compared the firing of ripples that occurred at the down to up transition, shown by the blue box in P1 in the blue bars in C1 and C2, and ripples that occurred at the up to down transition, shown in the green box in B2 and the green bars in C1 and C2. In the non-seizure onset zone, we found that very few neurons, show, very few individual neurons showed a firing preference. And those that did showed very small effect sizes. However, in the seizure onset zone, we found that 17% of the neurons showed a preference of firing to the up to down transition with considerable effect sizes. We hypothesized that these neurons are pathological neurons that are involved in generating pathological HFOs epileptiform discharges, and maybe even seizures. We also asked, using Yuval's data, whether fast ripples exhibited similar excitability differences to ripples. We found, indeed, that fast ripples in the seizure onset zone and fast ripple associated action potentials in the seizure onset zone occurred at the highest probability at the late up to down transition. Similarly, in the non-seizure onset zone, no individual unit showed a firing preference to fast ripples at the up to down transition, but in the seizure onset zone, 20% of the neurons showed a preference to firing to fast ripples at the up to down transition. To further confirm that the neurons that fire preferentially to HFOs at the up to down transition are pathological, we correlated the firing rate with the spectral power of the HFO. Pa HFOs with larger spectral power are found more often in epileptogenic regions. And we hypothesized that the neurons that generate these larger power HFOs may be pathological neurons. Shown in panel A is an illustration of a hypothetical unit that fires more in response to larger power HFOs. Shown in panel B is the actual response of the neurons that showed a preference to firing to the up to down transition, showing that they more vigorously fire to larger power HFOs on bottom than lower power HFOs on top. Shown in panel C are the neurons that showed a preference to down to up transition of slow wave excitability. And shown in panel D are the majority of neurons that were indifferent. Note that in panel B, only the neurons that fired with a preference to ripples and fast ripples at the up to down transition showed significantly much more vigorous firing to larger power HFOs. Then in panel E, we found that the steepness of the firing as a function of the HFO power correlated with the effect size of the up to down firing preference. This suggests that the degree of excitatory inhibitory imbalance experienced by an individual neuron corresponded with how vigorously it would fire to larger power HFOs. Finally, as I mentioned earlier in the talk, we found that fast ripples preceding spikes showed more vigorous firing than fast ripples that occurred alone. And again, we found that this was the case among all neurons, but specifically, the up to down, the neurons that showed a preference to firing to HFOs at the up to down transition exhibited the most vigorous firing, suggesting that these neurons are the pathological neurons. Then, as I mentioned earlier in the talk, ripple temporal correlations or coincidences are thought to be important in memory consolidation and information transfer. To study this in our patients with epilepsy, we examined ripple event cross correlelograms between the entorhinal cortex and hippocampus and parahippocampal gyrus and hippocampus in both the seizure onset zone in red and the non-seizure onset zone in blue. We found that ripple temporal correlations were significantly reduced in the seizure onset zone. And this effect was mediated by global slow waves 
as opposed to local slow waves. We believe that the disruption of ripple temporal coupling may be a new and important mechanism that could impair information transfer and memory consolidation in patients with epilepsy who are known to have memory consolidation deficits. We also found a similar finding for fast ripples, which will be important later in my talk. Synthesizing our findings, we must review the synaptic and cellular basis of the up to down transition. During the up state, excitatory and inhibitory conductances are increased in a balanced manner. During the up to down transition, paradoxically, inhibitory conductances decrease. This is a paradox because one would think that during the down state, inhibitory conductances would decrease. Recently, an uh, inhibitory interneuron named the ID2 NKX2.1 neuroglioform cell has been identified. And this inhibitory interneuron is itself released from inhibition at the down state and inhibits other neurons. We propose that the neurons that are most pathological exhibit chloride ion dysregulation such that the inhibition becomes excitatory. And this results in preferential generation of HFOs during the up to down transition. Neurons that fire more vigorously to larger power HFOs and to HFOs during spikes, fast ripples at prime spikes, and a disruption of ripple temporal correlations important in memory consolidation. So in conclusion, during slow wave sleep, pathological ripples occur during the up to down transition of slow wave excitability whereas healthy physiologic ripples occur during the down to up transition. We found that the pathological ripples that are generated up to down, at, that are generated at the up to down transition are generated or recruited hyperexcitable pathological neuron clusters. And these pathological neuron clusters fire more vigorously during pathologic HFOs of larger spectral power and fast ripples that precede spikes. And then interregional communication between brain regions may be mediated by ripple temporal correlations. And we found that ripple temporal correlations are reduced in epileptogenic tissue, possibly because of pathological ripple generation. And finally, that excitatory inhibitory imbalance at the up to down transition may be due to depolarizing GABAergic conductances, which may be a new mechanism to target for anti-seizure drugs. The final part of my talk will focus on epilepsy surgery and improving the outcome of epilepsy surgery using fast ripple graph theoretical metrics. The two most common types of epilepsy surgery involve resecting or blading with a laser, the seizure onset zone, or implanting the responsive neurostimulator system, RNS, into the seizure onset zones. These treatments are not perfect. In some cases of extra temporal lobe epilepsy, only half of the patients are seizure-free after surgery. And most patients implanted with the RNS system only have a 50 to 75% reduction in seizures, but are not seizure-free. In retrospective studies, resecting enterical fast ripples have shown to be an improvement over resecting the seizure onset zone, which is a clinical gold standard. However, even in these studies, some individual subjects in the study cohort have large fast ripple regions resected, but still continue, uh, well, but still continue to experience seizures. And we hypothesize that not all fast ripple generating regions are equally important for seizure generation. And we could identify the more important fast ripple generating regions using fast ripple graph theoretical analysis. So graph theoretical analysis is a branch of mathematics and we can use it to calculate spatial and temporal correlational measures of fast ripple networks. And these metrics can be compared with completeness of the resection of a seizure onset zone or the fast ripple resection ratio. So to illustrate epilepsy surgery, shown on the left is an amygdalo hippocampectomy and shown on the right is following com completion of the implantation of the RNS system. The table on the left is, uh, displays the three fast ripple graph theoretical metrics that we designed and used in our study. The first, the rate distance radius resected difference 
is a spatial graph theoretical measure. The second and the third are temporal correlational graph theoretical metrics. The path length or gamma resection ratio, gamma or R, and the unresected mean local efficiency, URMLE. Shown on the right is an illustration of the graph theoretical metrics in hypothetical networks. In this illustration, the circles or nodes colored blue generate fast ripples at low rates, and the nodes colored red generate fast ripples at higher rates. Panels A illustrate the rate distance, resec the rate distance radius resection difference, and panels B illustrate the gamma RR in URMLE. In panels A, the distance around the circle is the Euclidean distance. It's distance in centimeters or millimeters. And it's also the edges between the nodes are determined by the fast ripple rates and the distance between the nodes. The rate distance radius of the whole network in panel, in panel A1 is less than the rate distance radius of the whole network in panel A2 because of the nodes generating fast ripples at lower rates than A1. However, the rate distance radius within the resected margins is the same in A1 and A2. Therefore, the rate distance radius resected difference in A1 is less than A2, corresponding to a seizure-free outcome in A1 and a non-seizure-free outcome in A2. Then in panel A3, you can see that outside the margins of the resection, the fast ripples are all generated at low rates. However, they're spatially widespread. Thus, the rate distance radius of a whole network in A3 is more similar to A2 than to A1. And the rate distance radius resected difference corresponds to a non-seizure-free outcome. We hypothesized that nodes that generate fast ripples both at high rates and desynchronously with respect to other nodes must be resected to achieve a seizure-free outcome. But in example A3, outside the margins of the resection, no such nodes were sampled. The rate distance radius resected difference can numerically compensate for spatial undersampling and nodes generating, generating fast repose at high rates that may have been missed. In panels B1 and B2, the distance around the circle uh, is unitless because the edges are weighted by mutual information. Two nodes that generate fast ripples relatively desynchronously as compared to each other are thought to have a low mutual information. A network with low mutual information edges has a longer path length. Local efficiency is the inverse of the path length in the local network. We found in our experiments that Patients with fast ripple mutual information networks with a longer path length had failed epilepsy surgery. We also found that nodes with high fast ripple rates and low local efficiency, if they were not resected, the patients often had failed epilepsy surgery. So to illustrate the gamma RR measure, the path length within the resected margins of panel B1 is longer than the path length of the whole network which corresponds to a gamma resection ratio of greater than one and a seizure-free outcome. Whereas in B2, the path length within the resection margins is less than the path length of the whole network, which corresponds to a gamma RR of less than one and a non-seizure-free outcome. Similarly, the unresected nodes in B1 have higher local efficiency than the unresected nodes in B2, which corresponds to a seizure-free outcome in B1 and a non-seizure-free outcome in B2. So I'm sorry for this exhaustive hypothetical mathematical illustration, but now I'm gonna explain what this means in terms of actual data. So we use a, a cohort of 23 patients who underwent epilepsy surgery to utilize these metrics and explore uh, if they could predict the post-operative seizure outcome. And we did this by looking at what electrodes were within the resection margins and what, which of these electrodes were generating fast ripples and making these networks and seeing what portions of the network were resected. So first we found that the seizure onset zone resection ratio, which is the clinical gold standard used today to plan a surgery, did not correlate with post-operative seizure outcome. So in this case, E1 corresponds to the patients who were seizure-free after the surgery 
E2 is patients who had rare seizures, and E3 are patients who had frequent seizures but were still improved. And E4, and we had many E4 patients in our study, are patients who had no improvement after surgery. Um, so they had a part of their brain, a significant part of their brain removed, and they showed no improvement. Um, the fast ripple resection ratio uh, is the proportion of fast ripples removed. And we again found that this measure did not correlate with outcome. Although the patients who had the worst outcome, no improvement showed a lower mean than the patients who showed improvement uh, or were seizure free after surgery. But then we looked at our spatial fast ripple graph theoretical metric, the rate distance radius resected difference. And we found that this measure did correlate with postoperative seizure outcome. So panels D through G are looking at the fast ripple uh, temporal correlational graph theoretical metrics. So shown in panel D are all the nodes, all the electrodes from all the fast ripple mutual information networks from all the patients. And for each node, we are comparing its fast ripple rate to its local efficiency. And so what we then did is we used something called k-means clustering to divide these nodes into three groups. And we found that there was a, a group in blue that generated fast ripples at the highest rates. And these fast ripples were also generated relatively desynchronously as compared to the other two groups. So looking at just the nodes in this group, we found that the proportion unresected correlated with the post-operative seizure outcome which means that a failure to resect nodes that generate fast ripples at high rates relatively desynchronously to other nodes um, results in the failure of epilepsy surgery or even no improvement. Um, then uh, the gamma RR and URMLE measure that are related to these, this measure, and I discussed at great length, they also correlated with the post-operative uh, seizure outcome. So this suggests that targeting parts of the brain that generate fast ripples at high rates, but also relatively desynchronously with other nodes um, is critical uh, to achieve effective epilepsy surgery. Um, so lastly, uh, we examined uh, patients who had the RNS device implanted. Um, and we found that fast ripple graph theoretical metrics can predict their post-operative seizure outcome years after the RNS stim stimulator had been implanted. So in current clinical practice, uh, the guidance or the placement of the stimulation contacts of the RNS device uh, is determined by the clinically defined seizure onset zone. So in our experiments, what we assumed is that the cortical tissue within a sphere of, with a radius of 1.5 centimeters would be maximally stimulated by the RNS contacts. And uh, this was based on uh, very basic research that showed that at the stimulation intensities used, uh, the neurons within that sphere would be uh, entrained by the stimulation. Um, so using uh, under that uh, assumption, um, we compared uh, three of 10 patients who exhibited something called an RNS super response. And when their RNS device was implanted, they had a 90% reduction in seizures. And then we compared that to seven intermediate responders who had a 50 to 75% reduction in seizures. So firstly, we found that the proportion of the seizure onset zone stimulated trended higher in the super responders than the intermediate responders. And then we found that the proportion of fast ripple generating tissue stimulated also trended higher in the super responders than the intermediate responders. But the only significant difference was our fast ripple graph theoretical metric, which was the fast ripple stimulated global efficiency. And this metric was significantly lower in the RNS super responders. And it should be lower because that corresponds to desynchronous fast ripple generation. And we also looked at ripples on spikes instead of fast ripples. And we found trends, but no significant differences in either the stimulation or the graph theoretical metric um, in this case. So these results suggest, of course, we only had 10 patients, but they suggest that optimal RNS uh, outcomes um, could be achieved by uh, targeting 
parts of the brain that not only generate fast ripples at high rates, but generate them desynchronously with respect to other nodes. So in conclusion, um, graph theoretical metrics of fast ripple networks can classify post-operative seizure outcome in patients who had resections, ablations, and patients implanted with RNS better than using the seizure onset zone stimulated or resected um, and uh, just the fast ripple resection or stimulation ratio, which I just want to specify, you know, is a, a ratio of the, the, the regions and how much in that region is actually generated as opposed to looking at their correlations. Um, and then moreover, um, successful surgery requires specifically targeting the fast ripple network nodes that are both highly active and generating fast ripples desynchronously with other nodes. Um, so thank you. I think I finished this talk earlier than I had expected. Um, so that leaves a lot of time for questions, which I'm sure there'll be a lot. Um, so I really wanna thank um, my mentors at UCLA, um, Dr. Richard Staba um, and uh, Dr. Pete Engel, um, who uh, continue to support me and are very interested in my work and have supported this work for decade over a decade. Um, and Dr. Anatol Bragan, who did some of the uh, initial work on fast ripples and is still very active. Um, and uh, Itzhak Fried, who is the inventor of this electrode that records uh, single neurons from patients and also a very amazing scientist in his own right. Um, Dr. Wong at Downstate, Dr. Mike Sperling um, at Jefferson, um, and the uh, other neuroscientists who and neurosurgeons who have worked with me over the years. And I would particularly like to thank Dr. Yuval Nir, um, who's uh, quite an incredible scientist and who's at Tel Aviv University. Um, and uh, I have a, a medical student working in my lab who uh, participated in some of this work, and I've had students in the past. Um, and you know, I'd be happy to discuss with you, uh, you know, some, you know, possible research opportunities too. So, um, thank you very much. Hi, Dr. Weiss. There is a question in the chat box. Yeah, I, I mean, this, it's going to take, this research has been slow going at the community, at the level of the research community. Um, so one problem is that initially there was a lot of excitement that fast ripples could be used in intraoperative electrocorticography. And so intraoperative electrocorticography is used very often for children because children can't tolerate, especially young, very young children like infants, they can't tolerate having the electrodes implanted for like a week or two weeks, right? So what they do is, especially if there's a lesion like a benign brain tumor or a focal cortical dysplasia, um, the, the children will go right to the OR and they'll do a craniotomy and explode, expose the brain and they'll put a grid of subdural electrodes on the brain and they'll record epileptiform spikes um, and based on where they see the spikes, um, or sometimes they even see seizures, but based on where they see the spikes, they'll plan to, the resection right then and there, and they'll do the resection, they'll do the resection right then and there. Um, so there were several research groups that proposed that when you see a fast ripple in these like five or 10 minute recordings, that would with great precision tell you where to resect. Um, and in fact, in, uh, in the Netherlands, um, they did a clinical trial um, and they enrolled about 70 or 80, uh, mostly children. And there were some problems with the clinical trial, um, but essentially what they found was, well, the, the biggest problem was the control group had results that were much better than expected. Um, and it turned out that there was no superiority um, to, to resecting the regions generating fast ripples and or generating high frequency oscillations. 
Um, so that raised a lot of concern um, about uh, where the field was going and you know if this was going to translate. Um, and then uh, you know a, a whole nother side of the field said, well, that's really not the way you're supposed to do this. Um, you really want to be recording from inside the brain using these depth EEG or stereo EEG. And there's so much variability because in some parts of the brain, these fast ripples can occur once every five minutes. Um, you really need to record for hours of sleep um, and analyze hours of sleep to be able to understand uh, you know, what areas are generating the fast ripples the most and how they're connected. Um, so that area is still very active, um, but there, there are some doubts um, about uh, whether it's gonna display, you know, if, if the field is gonna move towards, um, away from resecting the seizure onset zone. Um, I would say every epilepsy center in the world um, resects the seizure onset zone. Um, but, uh, it, you know, the, I think the results that I showed and a, a lot of this work has come from uh, the Montreal Neurological Institute and McGill. Um, there are also uh, some really active groups um, elsewhere, uh, particularly in Europe. Um, and it's very promising. So you know, I think, you know, five, 10 years down the road, um, you know, th there may be an improvement in the outcomes from epilepsy surgery from using high frequency oscillations and in particular fast ripples. Yeah. Any other questions? Let's see, I think there's there's someone on the chat. Um, okay, so um, Steve Spar says, there's a correlation of fast ripples and seizures um, beside informing surgical resection also have applications to drug development. Uh, so I think the, the answer is yes. Um, and uh, understanding the physiology of these fast ripples. So the fast ripples themselves are generated by action potentials. Um, and the ripples in healthy parts of the brain are generated by inhibitory postsynaptic potentials and action potentials. Um, and you know, I, I hope that through the work that I'm doing and other people are doing that understanding the physiology of what generates these events that have pathological influence will uh, be able to lead to uh, discoveries that could uh, help inform drug development. Um, Okay, Any, anyone else? Okay. Okay, so Dr. Kari uh, asked, does scalp EEG have enough sensitivity to pick up ripples and fast ripples versus intracranial recordings? Um, so that, that's a very, very good question. Um, thank you, Geetha. So, uh, Jean Gottman, who uh, is a professor at the Montreal Neurological Institute, uh, published a paper in neurology uh, almost eight or nine years ago, uh, describing ripples and fast ripples in scalp EEG. Uh, subsequently, uh, several prominent researchers in the field have described particularly scalp ripples as um, being important in uh, diagnosing uh, epilepsy in children. And uh, they've shown also that the frequency or rate of the ripples um, is correlated with uh, disease severity. Um, so it's very interesting. Uh, from an experimental standpoint, um, having done this research, I, I once attempted to study scalp uh, ripples um, in the past, it is a very, very difficult thing to do um, because um, if you are recording from subjects who are not in non-REM sleep, there is a lot of muscle activity and even the slightest muscle activation can mimic a uh, ripple or a fast ripple. And uh, it confounds these studies in a very uh, 
significant way and it's very treacherous. Um, so in my opinion, I think that the study of scalp HFOs uh, should be promoted, but I think that uh, it needs to be done very carefully, particularly uh, because of the problem with the artifact. And I really, personally, I, I trust data obtained from sleep uh, from non-REM sleep much more than anything that's obtained during the awake state or, uh, you know, both awake and asleep. Um, but it, it, it shows promise. And I think also that for infants and very young children, um, there may be, you know, due to the growth of the skull, um, there, there may be, it may be easier to record ripples and fast ripples from the scalp than an adult. Um, but I don't know. I mean, I, I, I'm not quite sure about it. Um, so Dr. Perk asked the question, can desynchronized nodes be synchronized as a protective mechanism? Um, yeah, so, so first I wanna emphasize in, when I talk about these synchrony and desynchrony. So um, when I talk about fast ripples are in fact generated by, synchron by synchrony. So fast ripples at the cellular level occur when neurons are rapidly uh, firing action potentials together at a level of synchrony that would not be expected in a healthy nervous system. But when I say desynchrony, you know, really what I'm referring to is that, you know, for anyone who's read EEG, particularly intracranial EEG, you know, you might just see like one electrode contact and that one electrode contact is just really hot and it's generating a lot of activity that you don't see in the other contacts. It's generating a lot of spikes and ripples and fast ripples. Um, and that's what I refer to as desynchrony. That, that is the basis of what the mathematics is describing. Um, individual channels that are much more active generating epileptiform activity than other channels. Um, so uh, I, you know, as far as what can be done to synchronize or desynchronize, I mean, one thing that might be really exciting to try to do um, is, you know, fast ripples prime epileptiform spikes to occur next. Um, you know, a, a kind of cool idea would be that if you stimulated when a fast ripple is occurring in the spike initiation zone, you might be able to prevent the epileptiform spike from occurring next. So if you inhibit the fast ripple, maybe the spike won't occur. Um, and I, I don't, you know, I, you could think of that as a form of synchronization. Um, but yeah, I think that, that would be a really interesting experiment to try. Um, and, you know, you could theoretically do it in an epilepsy monitoring unit and see if it works. Okay, any last questions from the room or? Okay, well, thank you everybody and have a good Friday. And uh, I'm really glad I got to present my work for all of you. Take care. Thank you, Dr. Weiss. Thank you.